Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like there are still a few people coming in to into the webinar, but we'll go ahead and get started. On behalf of the Field Museum's Women in Science group, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today in our first ever virtual Field Museum Women in Science Science Mixer. I'm Leslie D'Souza, a conservation scientist at the Field Museum's Keller Science Action Center and co-chair of the Field Museum Women in Science Steering Committee with Amy Davis, who is Director of Learning at the Field Museum. The Field Museum Women in Science Group has over a thousand members and our mission is to inspire, to encourage and to increase participation of women in the sciences. We have an incredible program tonight for incredible women in science and I can't wait for you guys to meet them and hear what they have to say about their journey as a woman in science, the challenges, the victories, and the way that they advocate for themselves. And words of wisdom for aspiring women in science and for women who already are well on their career. Um, we're honored uh, to host people from all over the US um, and thankful for an opportunity to be able to continue this event um, even through in the midst of this pandemic. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few Zoom housekeeping tips. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout the program to the Q&A option below at the bottom of your screen. And towards the end of the program, I will ask you, um, Amy and Davis and I will ask questions to our panelists. Um, if you have any technical issues with Zoom, just type those into the chat and we'll work to get those, those resolved. Um, we will give you instructions about the breakout session that is after this panel discussion towards the end of the panel discussion. So just stand by for those instructions. We hope you all will join us in a more intimate conversation with our panelists. Field Museum Women in Science is generously supported by the Women's Board of the Field Museum. I'm thrilled to introduce Bev Panair who will share a little bit about the impactful ways the Women's Board has supported women in science and introduced our moderator of the event, Dr. Linda Williams. Welcome, Bev. Thanks, Leslie. Hello, everyone. I am Bev Panair, and I'm a Women's Board member at the Field Museum and co-chair of the Women in Science Outreach Committee. Along with fellow Women's Board member and this evening's moderator, Linda Williams. This year marks 20 years of the Women's Board Women in Science Initiative. What began as an effort to fund one fellowship is today a robust field museum community. Each spring, the Women's Board hosts a Women in Science Luncheon, which is a celebration of female leaders in STEM fields and the next generation of scientists. The luncheon funds paid summer internships for high school and college age young women, a fellowship for a woman working towards her PhD, a two year postdoctoral research position and ongoing events, lectures and programs for women from the scientific community like this mixture. The Women in Science program aims to make the Field Museum a dynamic, supportive place where all scientists and aspiring scientists can be successful. Since its inception, proceeds from the luncheon have directly supported more than 80 women at various points in their scientific career. This year's luncheon was postponed until May 6, 2021, but we are excited to feature two fantastic speakers next spring. Former CEO of Patagonia, Christine McDivitt Tompkins will be in a conversation with conservationist Wendy Paulson. Please stay tuned for more details and save the date for May 6th. Um, proceeds from the Women in Science Luncheon also sustain the outreach program. This is a partnership between the Women's Board and students from three public schools, OR Academy, Solario Academy, and Spear Academy. In a typical year, this partnership would include 
in school workshops, a field trip to the museum with behind the scenes access to the exhibitions and museum labs, opportunities to connect with scientists and women's board members, and an invitation to attend the Women in Science luncheon and an exclusive meet and greet with the keynote speaker. Unfortunately, uh, we're not able to visit the schools this year. But I am delighted that some of the young women from our outreach partner schools have joined this webinar. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to them. We are so glad that you are here. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Linda Williams. Linda is very impressive. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree from Loyola University of Chicago in criminal justice before starting her career in education as a classroom teacher for 16 years in public and parochial elementary schools. She went on to receive a master's degree in curriculum and instruction at Xavier University of Louisiana. After a decade of working as an administrative leader in the public charter school system, Linda became a chief area officer and later network chief in Chicago Public Schools District 299. In total, she has evaluated teachers and school administrators for 21 years. In 2015, Linda completed a doctoral degree in educational leadership at Roosevelt University in Chicago. Currently, Linda serves as an educational leadership consultant to school administrators within the CPS and suburban districts, is the coach in the educational leadership programs of Teach for America in partnership with Harvard University, and is an adjunct professor at National Lewis University. So thank you again for being here and enjoy the program. And Linda, I will turn it over to you. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's such an exciting experience to have um, the opportunity to be the moderator this evening and to uh, facilitate this discussion with such amazing women in science. And so without further ado, I want to um, introduce each of the panelists to you and just listen to some of these things that these women are doing. It's just, it's just amazing. First, our panelist is Anna Gifty Opoku Adjaman, a Ghanaian born activist and writer and co-founder and CEO of the Sadie Collective, which aims to address the lack of black women in economics and related fields. She is also the co-founder and co-organizer of hashtag Black Birders Week. Welcome, Anna. Thank Our you. next panelist is Raven Baxter, who has a couple of other names she might be known by, and that is Raven the Science Maven, and also the Queen of Science Rap, internationally acclaimed science communicator and molecular biologist who works to progress the state of science culture by creating spaces that are inclusive, educational, and real. Welcome, Raven. Our next panelist is Laurel Bristow, and she's an infectious disease researcher at Emory University in Atlanta. Her Instagram videos explaining the coronavirus and related topics such as Down syndrome, air travel, I went to her site and it's just off the chain. <laughs> she has garnered close to 100,000 followers based on her videos. Our last panelist, um, Renalini Watsa, she's also known as Minnie. She's a, conversa a conservationist, uh, a biologist, science communicator and co-founder of Wildlife Research Program Field Projects International. She is currently the Bud Heller Fellow at the San Diego Zoo's Institute of Conservation Research. 
So she has been doing a lot of things about genomes and tropical disease ecology and so forth. So without further delay, uh, if everyone could turn on their cameras and we will start the, um, the panel discussion. So now I have a number of questions that you will be asked. And again, feel free, whatever questions resonate with you most, please feel free. We are looking forward to this discussion. So the first question, we're currently facing some of the most challenging crises of our time. Climate change, pandemic, civil unrest, racism and more. What is the cause that you are most passionate about? And what is something that you do that can advance solutions to these, to the, these causes? What advice would you give to other women to become agents? Um, I think I'll go first. So, you know, that's such a great question. <laughs> And something that is really important in light of what's going on. Um, so for me, I am personally very passionate about sort of bringing Black people at the forefront of power and power in a structural sense. So when we're talking about the people who are making decisions around whether or not we get vaccines or whether or not the economy lives another day, um, these are sort of the questions that I'm really passionate about. And it turns out a lot of these individuals who are making decisions like that sit in the fields of economics, policy, business, finance, and the like. And so what I do as the co-founder of the Sadie Collective and also as a science communicator um, right now is really bringing attention to the fact that Black people matter in these spaces. In fact, our perspectives are integral to these spaces, considering that a lot of times when we're seeing things like economic distress or civil unrest, it oftentimes happens with Black and Brown communities first before it sort of takes place across the nation. So in order for us to really have an impact and to ensure a more equitable world, it's important for us to include black and brown voices in the room and also to include them at every single level of power. So that's sort of what I do as the co-founder of the Sadie Collective, which right now is the only organization that brings attention to black women who are underrepresented in these fields. Great, thank you for that. Um, would any other panel yeah, I, so I would first, like Anna brings up such an important point about how we need uh, equal representation for everything that's going on. And I would also say, you know, when you, you phrase this question, it sounds so daunting. You know, there are so many climate change and the pandemic and, you know, uh, racial disparities and everything. And it can seem very overwhelming, but I think it's important for people to remember that all of these things are connected. So it, it doesn't mean that you have to do everything for everything. If you can pick one lane that you're very passionate about, that makes an impact. You know, climate change is what's leading us to having these pandemics because we're encroaching on, you know, pop the area that animals live in and we're having these zoonotic diseases transfer over. Um, you know, the pandemic is disproportionately affecting communities of color. And so it's, it's bringing to light racial disparities in our society. And so I think, you know, a lot of people might get paralyzed by the fact that there's so much happening, but you are able to be an agent of change and make a huge impact on um, like all of these issues if you pick one that you're passionate about that you can work towards. So just keeping in mind that small steps have big impacts because everything is interconnected. That's what's happening right now. Um, I can jump in next, Raven, if that's all right. Maybe. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So, um, I, I mean, I totally agree with you, uh, Lauren, because the the to me in my field of doing conservation biology, thinking about um, ending extinctions, thinking about preventing um, habitat destruction, and those are sort of my things that are involved in my job. You know, I, I I do believe strongly that that climate change is basically sort of the greatest existential sort of threat that the planet is facing, um, and human induced climate change. But just um, as we talk about how humans, you know, can cause and are contributing to this, um, the solutions also have to include humans. And 
no matter what you do, um, I think environmental justice fails if you don't think about social justice as well. And so thinking about the people that participate in all of this, uh, the people most affected by this being often um, communities of color, this is something that you have to sort of address on a much bigger scale um, in order to be able to, you know, uh, to actually have an effect. My children have just run into the room. I'm sorry, this is <laughs> bound to happen. But um, let me just finish before they invade my space. But um, I would say that the the going along that lines of thinking about, oh, this looks so big, climate change is this huge problem. You know, how do you even get started? Um, I think even if you can't actually work in, you know, some particular field that you think is going to have a direct impact, every conversation you have with somebody to show that they know that their vote is important, that voting in people who actually trust science and believe in it um, are, are uh, you know, that that's a very impactful thing that you can do as well. So there's always, I think, something quite handleable that you can achieve. All right, great. There's always something that we can do. That's wonderful. Um, Raven, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that question? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's important to remember that we have to solve these big issues in, in communities, right? Nothing is done alone. And I think that some of the things that I emphasize in my daily practices is reminding people that we are all in this together and that we really do owe it to each other to, to um, understand how to communicate with one another and how to communicate these issues to one another, even in times when maybe one side of the conversation, you know, somebody's not really as knowledgeable as the other, or maybe not familiar with the issues going on. I think it's important for us to remember um, to be humans first and and respect each other on that basic level, so that we can so that we can work as a team you know, in society to band together and, and combat these issues. Um, so yeah, that's that's largely what I focus on on my platform is, is modeling how to have those respectful conversations about hot topics and debatable issues and important issues that concern our society and the future of our planet. Okay, great. Well, um, coming off of that question, how is 2020 affecting your career? Whether it's positively or conversely, how, what, what effects are you seeing in your career? I think it, it, it's been a bit weird. It's been a horrible, horrible year for so many reasons, so many obvious reasons. Um, and yet more of what I've said or done in this year seems to have been sort of heard, um, you know, more this year than any other. And so I'm in this sort of bewildering, I think, spot. I, I don't know if you guys would agree. It's been a very uh, confusing experience, I think. Um, I, I would say I probably have a unique experience among the panelists in that COVID hit and all of my research stopped and completely switched over to COVID. And that's what I've been doing for the last eight months. Um, so for me, it's been an extremely busy time. I just happened to be in a position where I was doing research on respiratory pathogens and I am in the same city as the CDC and um, things really kind of took off for me. And so it's weird to think of it as, as any of this as like being beneficial to anyone, right? Because it's such a huge detrimental thing to so much of the, the country and to the world right now. Um, but it's definitely, I've been grateful that I have been able to be so involved um, in the work to figure this virus out and figure out uh, solutions out of this because um, I think it, it's been an incredible learning experience for me in terms of you know my role in this response and also just, I feel very lucky that I'm in a position, A, that I continue to work and that also I can share my work with so many people on Instagram and to give them a sense of comfort and understanding um, to have a better grasp of what's happening in the pandemic. That's amazing, Laurel. Um, and I wanna kind of tag on with what Mernalini said about this being such a weird experience, you know, I. I don't think anybody knew who I was <laughs> in January. Um, 
I was definitely active in the science communication space, but when the pandemic started, um, it was my main priority to make people comfortable. I live in New York, by the way, not in New York City, but I'm in New York State, and we were one of the first places hit um, when the pandemic started here, and we were on lock lockdown, like serious lockdown first in the country, and it was very scary. And my first knee-jerk reaction was to make everybody comfortable and to inform and educate the people around me. So um, naturally that ended up being a rap music video and uh, that went viral, like super viral. Um, but people were at home and they were able to listen and take in that important information. And, um, you know, months later we had, you know, civil unrest, right, happening in our country and all of a sudden it was important, you know, it became important for people to listen to me and, uh, you know, that's been a little weird, right? I think it's been a weird uh, time. I'm, you know, it's a bittersweet thing because I'm grateful that people are now paying attention, um, not only to major issues, but also people who have a lot of important things to say um, to the world. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm also kind of navigating this space in in a weird way, kind of like how Mernalini said. Um, but you know, it's I've met a lot of really awesome people and been able to network with other scientists who have great ideas and want to continue working on advancing uh, science, culture, and society as a whole. So, and one of those people includes Anna. Anna, do you do you want to go? <laughs> Thanks, Raven. Yeah. So. So, you know, I'm not a COVID-19 researcher. So, you know, huge kudos to you. We, we thank you so much for your service, honestly. Um, but I, I am somebody who's been pretty vocal around diversity and inclusion in the spaces that I occupy. And like Raven was saying, all of a sudden, everybody caught up with the 400 year history that racism is bad. Um, and we're now having this conversation globally, really, because um, we're seeing police brutality happening in Nigeria and other countries within the continent. So when we're talking about, you know, uh, at least for me, like how things shifted, I just graduated from college last year, right? So, you know, I'm minding my business. I'm on Twitter, you know, talking about Marvel <laughs> and on occasion dragging my discipline for being racist and sexist, right? But at some point that sort of changed, right? When COVID-19 hit, I started noticing that, you know, for example, in the news, they were talking about racial health disparities, but not amplifying black voices. And then all of a sudden I was like, okay, wait a minute. Like, you know, you can't be talking about sort of how this illness is disproportionately affecting black and brown people and then not actually listening to black and brown people. So I wrote an article called, you know, do black economists matter? And Donna Brazil, who is the former DNC chair, you know, found it <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. And I, that's kind of when I noticed that there were, you know, a number of people starting to pay attention to what I was saying, even though, you know, I'm, I'm pretty young and I'm still learning in the space. Um, and I would say things sort of shifted with Black Birders Week. So um, not only am I one of the co-founders and one of the co-organizers, I'm actually the brainchild of that week. And basically what we ended up doing was um, noticing that, you know, Christian Cooper's incident with Amy Cooper in Central Park in New York went viral, right? Like in an <laughs> astronomical way, she was trending for a couple days, right? And so basically I'm in a group chat with a bunch of black birders and naturalists and we're all talking. And again, I'm not in this space, I'm economics and policy, but I'm noticing that they're all saying the same thing. They've gone through this experience themselves and you know, they, you know, they're so frustrated with how things are going. And I said, why don't we actually re, you know, I understand the power of na narrative to some degree. How do we, you know, kind of reshift the narrative to focus on black joy, black joy in nature. And so that's sort of where things kind of took a turn, right? I didn't know that Black Birders Week was going to go viral, but that's essentially what happened. And basically after that went viral, I was able to connect with a lot of people in the science community, including the wonderful Raven Baxter and a number of other individuals who then created their own separate weeks like Black and Astro, Black and Chem, currently Black and Math Week is coming up next. I'm a co-founder of that. So again, like 
just kind of being a part of the space, seeing how racism is being talked about. And um, as many mentioned, sort of like how it's integrated to every aspect, right? Like a lot of times when people are talking about these issues, they talk about climate change in a silo, they talk about racism in a silo. But again, these things are interconnected and sort of we're seeing everything compound on these, itself right now. So that's kind of how I fit in. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. That's the perfect segue into the next question. So what have been some of the major hurdles that you've encountered in your career as either just women or women of color? Um, I, you want me to jump in? Can I? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. So, please. Yes. Um, I've had two things. I'm not sure I could, you know, necessarily in the end can term them hurdles because the hurt, you know, the word implies that it's something you can jump over and get to the other side of. And sometimes I think these are more sort of burdens that you just kind of carry and you have to learn to cope with and you don't necessarily, mm -hmm. there isn't, you know, an easy sort of, uh, or, or even a possibility of getting over them. But um, I think um, I have a couple of stories for that one. So um, one is that I've found that people have tended to confuse my passion for what I do with emotion. And I think being a woman, that is very easy to do. You know, women get um, termed upset. I'm not upset. I'm angry at an injustice. And that is a very distinct thing. Yes. Um, and, you know, things like that. And nothing seems to irk people more than like being an angry woman. If maybe, maybe, you know, being an angry woman of color is worse, but that, that, that really seems to get under people's skin. And I, you know, I've had people say, I'm, I'm so proud of you for fin finishing your PhD. You know, I just didn't think that you were so emotionally connected to it that I didn't think you'd succeed. And um, I have <laughs> been like, and I have a lot to say about that anyway. Um, but that, that, that's one thing. Um, and the second is I have, um, you know, you just narrowly missed my, my twin four-year-olds coming in here and I, and I'm a conservation biologist and I do field work. So I go regularly to, um, the field as we call it kind of in, in this field. Um, and it means, you know, I'm, I'm at a remote site. Um, my field site is in Peru in the Amazon rainforest. Um, and where mind you, it can be remote, uh, but there are Brown women raising children there all the time anyway. So this is not, a, you know, as insane of a concept, but the fact that I had to take my children with me to do field work or bring them along has been met with so many, you know, forms of resistance. So like, um, let's see, one of my favorites was, so now that you're a mother, um, you know, who should I talk to about the project? Like, you know, and still me, sorry, I'll be changing a diaper and doing that can do both it's okay you know and so a lot of that sort of thing or or I think people that arrived at the field station expecting to be like I'm so cool I'm this deep dark Amazon and there's a two-year-old you know it's just like deflates them a little bit and so I think this this concept that you would persist with what you're doing despite having a family and this kind of career um, has been something I think that I've had to um, I've had to sort of, uh, again, I think just carry with me because it doesn't, it isn't something that, you know, once you talk about it to one person, perhaps they stop, but it's a very large uh, ever present kind of problem. Um, so anyway, those are my, those are my little. Wow, that's uh, really story. interesting, that pers perspective. Mm -hmm. um, would any of you, any of the other ladies like to share what have been some of the hurdles that you've encountered either just as women or a woman of color yeah, in your I'll, career path? Yeah, I'll add really quickly. And I think Raven can also add as well, right? Being a black woman anywhere is a form of protest. People just don't think that, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to say, right? Just us breathing is a problem for some folks, right? As we saw with Breonna Taylor. So when we're talking about, you know, hurdles and obstacles you know being a black woman like you you basically have to come against a lot because there's this element of race if you add an ethnicity to that that's also an element and then there's this womanhood right even the term you know women and minorities women who are minorities are missing that right so even that is some level of a hurdle so what i'll say about my personal experience is that I think at nearly every level of my education, I've had a lot of support. However, I've come against a lot of sort of resistance, right? So, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm co-founding Black and Math Week. 
I actually majored in math, but before I majored in math, I was in biology. I did not like it at all. <laughs> but, you know, when I was thinking about changing my major to math um, very early on in my career, I actually had one of my math teachers who I did really well in their class. He was a white guy say that, you know, he didn't think I could do it. I asked too many questions. That was his reason. Um, and, you know, as an impressionable, you know, fresh out of high school student, like I was like, yeah, you're probably right. Like you've seen me in this setting. And as I've gotten older, I've seen that that's actually <laughs> a recurring thing, right? You know, white guys telling you, you can't do something, <laughs> you know, like that's just something that, you know, they unsolicited advice that you never really asked for, but it's still offered anyway, um, in the best of intentions, right? So, you know, I think that's stuff I've come against too. And then, you know, also this element of you know, as you are moving up, especially as a young person in whatever field, some people feeling like, you know, you're, you're not qualified to be here, right? Literally trying to project the imposter syndrome onto you or something like, you know, you're too active on social media. Are you really, you know, the, the best person to talk to about this sort of thing? I've come against that too. You know, I'm 24. So I got folks who are a little older than me saying, you know, you got to go through the pain that I went through, go through the hurdles that I went through to get to where, you know, you are right now. Right. So this sort of, you know, level of entitlement to your success um, or to whatever progress you're going through. Right. And then I think the other element of it too, that I've gone against is, being a public facing woman and specifically a black woman in and of itself is an obstacle, right? <laughs> you know, people are just very bold and, you know, bold behind names that can't identify them in sort of a government system, right? <laughs> so for example, in my experience, I don't know of them personally, but I do know there are anonymous troll threads about your girl. People love to sort of talk about, you know, me in a way that, you know, it's kind of like, you don't know me. And if you did, I'm a pretty friendly person. I think I, I give off a friendly persona, at least online. Um, and I think one thing that I can cite is when I um, first got the Wikipedia page, which I thought was a really awesome experience, there was actually a bunch of trolls who attacked it. And they also attacked um, my other friends' page, pages as well, who are also Black women. And, you know, jokes was on them because eventually it became like an article talking about racial justice and how Wikipedia is a lot of bros, right? And that's kind of why you don't see a lot of women and, you know, people of color more broadly who are part of that space. So again, like being public facing, kind of being a black woman in the space, all of that, you know, comes against sort of who you are. But, you know, I guess the advice I would give is just standing your truth, right? Ultimately, you know, whatever is dark will come to the light. So that's something that I, I hold dear to. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, Anna, very powerful. Um, I second pretty much everything you said, so I won't repeat. <laughs> I won't repeat your points because I, I really do have the same points. And I think maybe I'll just say that I definitely use, you know, those, uh, barriers right as my strength and I recognize that it's because of the way society has been built and presents itself uh, those are the barriers right and I you know I personally make an active decision to not let those be barriers to me uh, I'm aware of them right they do exist but I certainly do not carry myself with some type of burden um, you know, because of the way I was born, I absolutely do move intentionally and positively and with, you know, poise and grace and, you know, just the way that I was raised to be. And I, I'm never, you know, as many adversities as there are for me as a Black woman, I absolutely won't allow this system and society to dictate how I carry myself. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I don't feel like I'm an imposter. I feel like I'm just me, you know. Um, just living in the world like everybody else. And uh, so it's not always easy, but that's that's what makes me comfortable. And I, I feel like um, it's kind of my goal to get other Black women to that space where we can kind of live freely and be free, you know, truly free mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. move in these spaces as our unapologetic selves. Okay, great. Um, Laurel, did you want to add anything just being the woman and, and being a woman and having these hurdles? Well, yeah, I think I think Anna and Raven covered a lot of really great points about it, especially as just as a woman who has like a public facing presence. Um, you know what I have found because this kind of Instagram 
recognition that I've gotten has happened so quickly and so um, over the last eight months and just realizing that uh, being a smart, outspoken woman who is, you know, in her field and is not afraid to talk about it, um, is very upsetting to some people. And, you know, I have, my followers are 92% female and yet those 8% of men still find their way into my comments. And you just have to realize that a lot of what happens when men want to, you know, make comments on you or try to add to the discussion in ways that you did not ask them to, um, a lot of people are trying to uh, reconcile the fact that they are not used to not being in a position of being the person who has the information or the attention for educating others and they want to insert themselves into that conversation in any way that they can. And so just remembering that that's not it's not about you really it's about what they want to do and how they feel the need to contribute even if it's not necessary in the moment. So I think we as women are socialized to share the spotlight, to step back, to you know give other people their space and not everybody else has had that experience or um, learned to do that yet. And so just to remember that it's not about you um, and that you can just release those comments and you don't even, don't even have to pay attention to them because they're gonna come one way or another. Mm -hmm. Great, and it's funny because I have a question that actually does say, that asks, do you see a change in men's attitudes towards women in your field? So you pretty much um, circulated that answer and just bringing that up, uh, are things getting better? And just by what you said, Laurel, well, that's questionable. Well, and yeah, go ahead. I think it's interesting because, you know, these, a lot of the times the experience I have are from men who are outside of my field, right? Who want to feel, they don't like the idea of not being an expert on a situation maybe. And so they want to contribute so that they feel like they can bring themselves up to the same level. Within my actual field in public health, I think because it is by default a um, field that is very empathetic, you know, you're caring about the population and about disease processes in the population. My experience personally with it has been majority female. I think I've had one male boss in my entire professional career. And I realized that I'm very lucky in that regard. But I do think, you know, the, the attitude towards women in at least my experience and in my uh, environment is that women are capable and they run it. Like there are a lot of very smart, qualified women running the show for public health. And so I think that's a really lovely environment to be in. And it's been so incredibly beneficial to me in my professional growth, just that I have not had to deal with that. My role models are female. My bosses are female. It's never been a question to me of if I can do this because I see other women doing it. And so that's why, you know, for someone like Anna, it's such so incredible that she's starting this young to make sure that those role models exist for people who look like her, for women who are younger than her to see that like, we are here and we can do this and it's not even a question anymore. You just get to have the experience that men have had forever of like, oh, that guy looks like me and he's in a position of power and I'm gonna get there too. Mm -hmm. Great. So let me just finish that last part. So what do you want to say to men today about women in science? And uh, if you'd like to go back to the first part of the question, so do you see a change in men's attitudes toward women in your field? Are things getting better? What do you want to say to men today about women in science? I, I think in, in, in my particular field, so if it, and it's a bit hard to also define it, you know, quite right, but maybe academia broadly um, or biology, biologists, ecology and evolution, I'd say on paper, you know, women are not banned from joining the same classes. You're not banned from voting. You're not banned from driving a car, owning a bank account. So we have these rights and we show up and we claim those rights and we do those things. But that doesn't mean, and that, that doesn't mean really that attitudes necessarily have changed as well, right? When laws change, don't, that doesn't always follow. And so I think that a lot of my colleagues at my age, you know, roughly younger than me, absolutely, I rarely ever feel any kind of any kind of even, you know, my 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 gender being noticed at all, um, or even my race. But I I think that um, the vast majority of older academics are largely white, largely male, 
Um, and there is definitely, I think, a lack of perspective on what it's like to go through this not being that way. So I've had people, um, you know, not be able to, I've not had all female role models. Um, I have amazing female um, role models now in my current position. Um, but overall, I'd say that uh, that's, a, that's a fortunate thing. That's not, that's not the case all the time. So if I had something um, to say to men in 2020, I would say it's 2020. It's time to get over it. That is my message to them about women in science. <laughs> All right. Well, unfortunately, we're approaching near the end of our conversation. However, I would love it if any of you would talk about mentoring. Um, who has been your mentor? What has that given you uh, in terms of your career path? Uh, and what would you take with you regarding that? Yeah, I'll, I'll weigh in on here. Um, mentoring is critical, y'all. If you don't got a mentor, go get one, please. And thank you, right? Um, for me, mentoring has been really critical to who I am today. And I think, you know, for me, I didn't know what mentors were until I think I got into high school, maybe even college, really. Um, but, you know, looking back, I really did have champions. That's really, really what I would advocate for, getting people who are champions. Um, there's this TED Talk that you ought to check out. It's by Rita Peterson, I believe. She's unfortunately mm -hmm. passed, um, yes. but it says every kid deserves yes. a champion. Mm -hmm. And what that really boils down to is you deserve somebody who would advocate for you and be sort of, you know, somebody like your, your best sort of advocate when you're not there. That's the kind of person you need especially if you're moving through the fields of science, right? Um, you know, as many mentioned, like academia is crazy, okay? Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> it's, the, it's not a meritocracy. There's a lot of politics that go on. There's a lot of unspoken rules. You need somebody who's gonna advocate for you, right? Even if you're going through sort of your college career or, or any kind of vocational career, like there's there needs to be somebody who's there to give you advice. And the way I, I always phrase mentoring is, you know, mentoring is kind of like if you're driving on a highway, right? And you're in the HOV lane, you pass all of the, the extra stuff that all, all of the hurdles you might have encountered had you not had that foreknowledge from somebody who's already gone through it. So I would say, you know, again, mentor, be a mentor, be mentor. Those things are really important. I'll go ahead and let Raven weigh in as well. <laughs> Yes, um, I think to add on to everything that Anna said, I'll also say that recently I've learned about, you know, mentorship versus sponsorship and where mentors are people who give you advice and um, really kind of guidance on your way, but sponsors are sort of a different uh, variety of mentorship in that they are distributing their power from their platform and putting it on your platform. So these would be, you know, people who, they don't necessarily even have to be your mentors, but they're people who recognize that they have some sort of power and privilege that could benefit you and are willing to use that and distribute it to your person so that you could advance. And so these could be, you know, actions as a sponsor could be like inviting you to a gala to network with um, leaders in your field so that you can now have more people in your circle or um, recommending you giving you recommendations you know if they if they know that they're a powerful per powerful person in the field um, lending you their name so that you can also have that on your platter when you go out into the world and things like that are examples of being a sponsor and I've learned that there's kind of a difference between a, being a mentor and a sponsor that I, I've learned is really important. So I've kind of, you know, as I've moved up in these spaces that I occupy now, I'm often finding that I'm looking back and seeing who can I sponsor, you know, who would benefit from, you know, shadowing me for a day and seeing what it's like to, to create content online and uh, come shadow me in my meetings and learn how to make a TV show and um, all of these things. So. Yeah, just turning around and giving back is is also important. Thank you so much. And I know that we have run a couple minutes over time. However, the wonderful thing is in the breakout sessions, you'll have a more intimate opportunity to also answer the questions that are coming up in the Q&A. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Leslie and Amy and they're going to field the Q&A session. 
thank you, ladies. It's been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you, Linda. Um, our first question is about imposter syndrome. Um, have you been, uh, have you felt imposter syndrome? Have you dealt with it? What is your experiences with imposter syndrome? We have a few questions about that. And if there's anything you want to add about mentorship, uh, if you didn't get to mention that, feel free to, to work that in as well. Um, I, yeah, would like to start with this one because imposter syndrome is something that I have felt my entire career, my whole life. It's something I have to actively work work against, uh, you know, today because you get such massive attention suddenly with COVID and everything. And so it can feel crazy that I'm thrust into this position so fast. And it's also felt crazy, you know, from my entire career. And I kept saying things to myself like, oh, well, I was just in the right place at the right time. Or, you know, this is why I'm in this position is because I knew someone. But the reality is like, you're in the position you're in because you worked to get there. And like, I always tell people, you know, early on, I might not have been the smartest person, but I worked the hardest and I worked at what I was trying to get to. And that's incredibly valid. Like it doesn't just have to be this mental state. It has to be the work that you do to get there. And there are little things that can happen that really reaffirm you and to help you fight imposter syndrome. Like it still stays with me when I uh, put data together for a conference we were doing at the CDC when I worked for tuberculosis control in San Francisco that my boss, the TB controller was giving. And at the end of the slide set, she thanked me as an epidemiologist and said, you know, I couldn't have done this without you. And like that sticks with me. She responded to an email where I critiqued somebody's survey design and said, these questions that you're asking them, these are not baby epidemiologist questions. These are very real. And so I think this uh, feeds into the idea of mentorship, that it's so important to have somebody who's above you, who's had more experience, who has a position of power, who's saying what you're doing is good and what you're doing is meaningful and you're on the right track. So again, I, I would also support finding a mentor, seeking out mentorship, because it just can have such a huge benefit to uh, mitigate any feelings of imposter syndrome that you might have. But also just remember you're here because you deserve to be here. Uh, just being women and especially women of color have to work extra hard to get where they are and you've put the work in, you know, this wasn't handed to you. So just trust that and trust yourself. I would only add one thing and that that if you do feel it too, that it's very normal, that, you know, plenty of people who you see as being potentially fabulously successful are probably feeling it also. So to kind of not, you know, not, it is, it is a very natural thing to feel like life has kind of happened to you a little bit. And you're like, you wake up and you're like, wow, am I being, you know, introduced as this or now I've earned this title and you, you know, it's a little surreal sometimes the whole thing. And so, but if that's okay, you know, it's okay to feel that way because a lot of people are feeling that way. So it, it shouldn't, um, you know, don't let it sort of unnerve you um, and do what you can, like Laurel said, to, to, to remember that you are worth, you've earned a lot of it. And so, you know, what, what you've done. And so you don't have to let it, let that feeling kind of dominate. Yeah, um, I think that's awesome, Renalini. And like, I probably am the oddball here in that I don't, I don't think I've ever felt imposter syndrome, but I blame my grandmother <laughs> because she's somebody who constantly like pumped my head up when growing up, telling me that, you know, girl, you got it, you know, can't nobody do it like you, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And so growing up, I never, I never felt like I deserved anything less than what I worked hard for. And um, to the point where, you know, when people would tell me that I couldn't do things, I'm like, you're definitely wrong, you know, I'm, and you're going to watch me do it now. Now that you told me I couldn't do it, now you got to see me do it. Um, so I've kind of moved in life with that attitude and definitely um, has helped me move forward faster because I've never really dwelled on imposter syndrome and feeling like I didn't deserve what I worked for. Um, and I mean, I guess, you know, if I ever have a family, I'm going to definitely make sure I carry on that legacy of making sure my kids are confident in this world from a very young age, because I feel like that's helped me a lot. Fantastic. That was, that's a great, um, that's kind of a great segue into a 
question that we kind of touched on already about mentorship. And one of the questions that um, an attendee is asking is, how do you find a mentor? And do you have advice on the best way to find a mentor? Um, yeah, um, I'll go ahead and take this. I feel like I'm a little bit of an expert on this now. So um, what I'll say is oftentimes the best mentors are right under your nose, right? So, you know, for example, if you're in the classroom and you really resonate with a teacher, that could, uh, you know, theoretically be your mentor, right? You never know what people um, have in terms of their life experience that could be really beneficial and impactful for your own journey. Um, you know, if I had to tell you more of the professional answer, I'd say, go on LinkedIn <laughs> and connect with people. Yeah, I mean, that's also another way too, though. I think those connections might feel less organic. Um, I will say this though, Twitter is a really amazing tool. So, you know, I used to be on Twitter for social reasons and then I shifted <laughs> off Twitter. Um, and then I came back on Twitter when um, one of my mentors advised me that there were a lot of really great people having interesting conversations and sharing resources. And it turns out that now some of the people who I consider closest um, to me as mentors and sponsors are people I met on Twitter exclusively. So I think again, you know, Twitter is one of those spaces as well as social media more broadly that kind of flattens sort of the communication, right? So the, the person who might be a Nobel prize winning whatever in this field, when they come on Twitter, they're just another at, you know, Nobel whatever name right and they like the same gifts and like the same tweets as you and you can have a conversation over that so I again finding different mechanisms and spaces in which you can sort of have these conversations organically is always advised and one thing I will say is that you know I know a lot of individuals might be students in this um, panel but you know one quick advice I would want to give to people is never settle for an email always go for a phone call Make sure that, you know, people actually hear your voice. They know who you are. Because I think for me, people be like, Anna, how are you able to network? And I'm like, I don't really network. I create relationships. And so the hope is that one of those relationships might lead to something that might be able to benefit me long-term, but that's not the intent in which I'm going into that conversation. I generally want to know more about that person's journey. And oftentimes those conversations end up resulting in mentorship or sponsorship, or some form of allyship. And again, you really want to get to a place where you feel a little bit more comfortable with talking to people. And even if you're introverted, you can just pick a couple people that you really resonate with and focus on that. So again, that's what how I would advise, sort of looking at social media, but also looking at you know your surroundings and who's around you and who resonates. Awesome. I think we have time for, for one more question. And this is your, your jobs are all so interesting and complex. When you first meet someone or you're talking to your friends, how do you describe what you do? So I can start and I, I think I'm in a unique position because right now everything I do sounds so sexy, you know, like, oh, I do COVID research and I'm an Instagram influencer because of it. You know, these are like exciting things. But before COVID, when I would talk to people, you know, it's just you're passionate about what you're doing or you would hope that you'd be passionate about what you're doing and that shines through you. So people like to listen to you if you like to talk about what you're doing, right? So I normally would tell people, you know, I'm an infectious disease clinical researcher. I run studies in the hospital or, you know, when I was in TB epidemiology, I always describe myself as a disease detective. Um, and so I just think, you know, if you're passionate about what you're doing, then that passion shines through and you're excited to talk about it and people are excited to hear about it. Yeah, I, th I, I don't think I've had all that much difficulty because I automatically I think you get a little bit of a free pass if there's animals involved and that <laughs> tends to kind of let you know break into conversations a bit easier yeah so I've, I've just you know I I make it I, I tend to I think I for example I study loads of things 
uh, to do with genetics. And one of the easiest collected genetic sample from an animal is its scat, right? So I'm like, I, I pick up poop for a living and I, I really do. I, and poop is amazing because it gives you all this cool information as a scientist. And so um, things like that to just kind of, I think, um, break the ice a bit. But yeah, usually you say, you know, wildlife and, and it's, not, it's not kind of the hardest thing to kind of break into. <laughs> I see you unmuting yourself. I did too. Um, but I'll go. I this is a question I struggle with because I wear so many hats. Um, but you know, so it's, I'm still trying to figure out how to explain what I do. But I think you know, off the cuff, I could say that I am working on and studying how to bridge gaps between science and the public through digital media, conversations, and fun. That's a great one. <laughs> great I time. just came up with that. So. Oh, <laughs> write it down, write it down. Write write it down. <laughs> Somebody write this down. Right, it's recorded, so we got it. <laughs> okay, boom, thank you. Yeah, um, I think I'll end and say, so economics is something that when people you know hear it, they're like, stock market, white guys in suits. It's actually way broader than that, right? So economics, the way I explain it is, we use math to ask questions about the world, especially in the social settings, right? So we use math to ask questions about people and why people do the things that they do. And sometimes those people reside in companies and sometimes those people reside in different parts of the world and we're trying to understand why they're making the decisions that they make. So that's basically what I do. And in, in my respective career, I would say, I do that in the sense of trying to get more black people into the workplace and the workforce. So I use math to do that. Um, and I also do that as an entrepreneur with the Sadie Collective. So yeah, that's kind of what I do. I just wanna say thank you guys. You're so incredible. And the energy that you guys have transmitted throughout this conversation is, is so wonderful. I, I feel like I'm watching a show. <laughs> <laughs> it's so wonderful. And I just thank you for the inspiration. I'm going to pass it off to Amy to close us and give us instructions for the breakout sessions. Yeah, thank you so much. This was truly an awe-inspiring conversation. Um, you all are amazing. Thank you to Linda for leading such a an amazing conversation. And the great news is the conversations don't end here. Uh, we have breakout rooms. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put a link in the chat for everybody to click on that link, which will take you to a meeting style Zoom call where uh, we will then put you into breakout rooms. We're going to ask that everybody clicks on the links immediately, goes into the new meeting, and then gives us about five to 10 minutes. So at 731, we'll start at 740 with the breakout rooms. So that will give us time to get everybody placed in breakout rooms. Uh, once you've logged in and give you guys a chance to go to the bathroom, grab a drink of water, uh, do what you need to do for our next conversations. Um, if you miss the link, all of the uh, emails that you use to register will now be receiving the link to the breakout rooms as well. So we will see you on the other Zoom call in just a moment. And I've just chatted the breakout room link. Um, see you all in a minute. Thank you.